Hey there, fellow casters, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And we know choosing cantrips should never be taken lightly, so today we're going to encode our thoughts in the message to you. And we hope it gives you guidance without too much resistance. So with much gusto, let's discuss the most versatile cantrips in D&D on today's Web DM. This episode is sponsored by Monty Cook Games and Tallis, the city by the spire. Their masterwork campaign setting for 5e and Cypher. Tallis is a fantasy city like no other. Find adventure in the vibrant streets, down its dangerous depths, and up the magical spire. It was derived from Monty's personal campaign, which ran for nearly a decade, and through the development and early days of 3rd edition. The two groups of players were all co-workers of Monty's, the makers of 3rd edition. Tallest the City by the Spire includes over a thousand pages, 672 pages in the campaign setting, and over 300 pages of maps, handouts, and bonus content updated and refined for 5e and Cypher system. It sounds like a lot, but its careful organization and dozens of thoughtful features make it easier to use than a typical game book. Download the free 32-page player's guide from MCG Store or drive through RPG Now, or just get the whole thing. Just check it out, folks. Link here and in the description. Okay, Jim, let's let's get on with this discussion on these these yeah. cantrips, these uh these 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 non-damagers. These are going to be right. your utility, the ones that give you the the extra little bits to fiddle around with, uh, maybe preparing for combat or whatever. But uh, <laughs> maximum shenanigan potential yeah. is the is the key here. Is getting up to shenanigans. We don't have to worry about the captain busting in the room and busting our balls for it. So no. so. No. <laughs> so, what what are you thinking of? What how do you? Th what's your thought process in picking cantrips uh, of this type? Yeah, for me, it's like I'm looking to like really focus in on my on my character's ability to like affect the environment to uh, like have a tool at their disposal that's versatile and and like allows them to put their plans into motion, things like that. So in, in this sense, I'm looking for cantrips that aren't like unitaskers. They don't just do one thing. They do multiple mm -hmm. things and have like a variety of uses, usually requiring some kind of creative interpretation, maybe negotiation with the DM in terms of what it can and can't do. But to me, that's a feature of these that, that we don't quite know mm -hmm. how this is going to work. So let's like talk it out. And, and come to a, uh, you know, something we can both live with and, and something interesting uh, that we can have for our adventures. Yeah, definitely. And also, uh, what, I, what I like about these also is sometimes you need to think about them in coordination with another utility cantrip yeah. to get, like, maximum efficiency out of sure. out of your your end goal but that's the thing is the <laughs> the synergy between utility cantrips once you really think it through you can have a lot of fun with that you know yeah i mean oh yeah for sure you know, if you, there's there's a way to create your own skating rink so <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah <laughs> in another way of 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 fitting in a segue a little more ham-fisted here if you check out our patreon uh you can get a podcast every week uh, every Friday we do a whole other podcast over there, so just uh, give it a check out. Uh, anyway, um, first off, Jim, yeah. uh, let's get let's get to the uh, the elemental essence of utility yeah. cantrips. Uh, yeah, and uh, fire off your favorites there. Yes, these are really fun. Um, they're part of the uh, Elemental Evil Player's Companion uh, that came out early in 5th edition. But you know, like to, to me, the, the two standouts of all of the elemental themed cantrips from that are Mold Earth and Shape Water. And like mm -hmm. Mold Earth is one of those that I, I personally find uh, enjoyable because it's like it, it, it affects dirt or stone. Most of the game uh, for, you know, for a lot of people takes place in an environment in which they are encased, surrounded by earth and stone. Uh, and so like the ability to, to affect yeah. a dungeon environment <laughs> or like a wilderness encounter or something is just really uh, limitless with this cantrip. And yeah, you could do it with a shovel and a pickaxe and the like, but this does it with like you know six seconds of somatic component, and then then you're done. Uh, and so and then like, you can do it again and, and again. Then you can just keep doing and it. Again. Right, right. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, like, some of the more like combat oriented effects, you do, you, you know, they, they do have a limited duration and then limited effect. But I'm really thinking of the one that just excavates and moves Earth uh, up to uh, five cubic feet of it in any direction, sort of like filling in pits, uh, creating pits, creating cover, creating uh, all kinds of, you know, different ways that you can reshape the terrain that you're in. To me, that that's that's the essence of what I'm looking for here. It lets me interact with the environment in a new way, in a different <laughs> way, and I really like that because sometimes as a DM, I'm going to put something in a dungeon or another like you know limited uh, access to adventurous location to get technical, uh, <laughs> and not have an answer for it. I don't know how the players are going to get past this. I, I have no idea, and either that's first level or twentieth level. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm presenting a challenge or an obstacle to the party and saying, it's up to you to figure out how to get past this. It's up to you to mm -hmm. figure out all the different tools you have at your disposal to overcome this obstacle and hit me with your best shot. And, you know, my, my uh, goal as a DM in that moment is not to like make them play mother may I and, and guess the right answer but to be open to a variety of possibilities of what they'll do. And a spell like Mold Earth yeah. is perfect for those situations because you can just reshape your environment and interact with it in novel and unique ways. Is that door locked? Yeah. We'll dig around the door. <laughs> you know, like, why do well, we try yeah, to go through the say, door? <laughs> providing, provide, like, this, it's one of the, 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 the dungeon features that I love, providing a door with no handle and no lock that is completely sealed and you can't knock it because it's like not even really a door, but sure. you can't dig through it. So just go around it uh, yeah. and, you know, show the DM that they are Pat Benatar. <laughs> start, um, yeah, start pulling up <laughs> flagstones. Get to that earth. Get to that soft earth yeah. that's underneath the, all that or, masonry. Or, <laughs> or digging, a, digging a big ass trench right next to a fast flowing river and luring uh -huh. the enemies into it. And then you use that one last mold earth to uh, get rid of the dam, so to speak. Uh, and you can flood your enemies out at least and, and separate yeah. you and, the, lot of fun and the enemy. You know, I mean, mm. it's just there's so many different <laughs> ways. I mean, and again, it's all about imagination and how much yeah. can you get out of this. Uh, and also, you obviously have to have some time. So this is this is really in situations where um, yeah. you want to it affect combat. Up. You need to have that time to set up an ambush or s just set up your battlefield, so to speak. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say it's similar with shape water because shape water is another one of those where like the volume of water that you can affect the things that you can do with it like it really is is one of those where all right do i have time do i do, you know first off can i find a, a sufficient amount of water to do some really fun stuff with this like create giant blocks of ice you know that are size of mm -hmm. cars <laughs> things like that uh or uh you know to or to take uh water and like reshape it so that it's it spikes and then freeze it so that you know you can throw people into it or drop them on top of it or oh yeah you know those those are the big things you can do with it creating giant blocks and objects of ice but the other thing is like flooding something and then freezing it you know that that door that we can't open uh or dig around with mold earth like can we pour water into it and then freeze it and see if that just doesn't break it you know break the lock mm -hmm. entirely and then open you know and just leave a, a wet puddle and a, <laughs> some broken machinery on the ground for somebody else to find like those are the kinds of things that i would want to do with shape earth or uh, sorry shape water because it's like my understanding of how water and ice and like the physical properties of it, a lot of what this is based on. And so there are going to be some DMs who are not, you know, they don't want to bring like that kind of real world physics into it. But to me, that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it interesting. Yeah. It's like I get to, first of all, I get to break the natural laws with this spell, but also my own understanding of how, you know, water and ice work is the entire basis for what I'm going to do with this magic. And so mm -hmm. it's it's a very uh, it's a it's a fun confluence of like player knowledge and character skill that I think is what makes RPGs fun, you know. <laughs> well, I mean also, uh, you know, just having a sheet of water across the ground that you then freeze between you and an enemy 
that's yeah. going to create uh, some difficult terrain that uh, creates the prone condition that creates advantage. <laughs> and that is the whole, like, again, mm. using some spell, uh, some of these cantrips in conjunction with one another, creating an, an open area, like you were saying, and putting ice spikes in it to create a pit trap with spikes that will stay frozen for an hour. And yep. that's a that's a that's a that's a big deal. Um, right. And and um, y yeah, like the the shape water where it can be animate. So you can also <laughs> like try to freak some people out with like maybe what they think is a water elemental that's yeah. walking towards them, which some people mm -hmm. we've discussed in, in shows past how a water ele elemental can be dangerous because it can just swallow you and drown you inside of it. So sure. DMs, if you've pulled that on your players before and now you have a lower level caster <laughs> who just needs to freak them out, have a water elemental, quote unquote, yeah. get up and start walking at them. It's just yeah. a cantrip, but, but they yeah. don't know that. <laughs> they don't know that. Yeah. There's a lot of fun things you could do if you've got like, you know, if you're a DM who's like portraying their NPCs in, a, in, in, in a way that where they're not privileged to the metagame information, right? Like those, those bandits don't know that this wizard's just casting a cantrip or whatever. For all yeah. they know, they, they, you know, targeted their water skin and, and pulled an extra dimensional creature out of it. And now it's about to come attack yeah. them. And similar to like Mold Earth or, or even something like Minor Illusion, uh, where you can trick others into thinking like a very low level spell is a higher level one because it mimics a similar visual effect. Mm -hmm. And Shape Water is kind of cool like that because it's like, yeah, what is this? This is I mean, like, just be honest, five cubic feet of water is a lot of water. It's a lot of water, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, the, well, the, the volume that this uh, spell can target can create some pretty interesting things, uh, especially mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're creative and, like I said, have a DM that's willing to negotiate with you on, on what the specific effect uh, of the cantrip is going to be. <laughs> yeah, but even just being able to pull up five cubic feet of, of a wall and freezing it at, for, for actual cover in a battle, mm -hmm. like that that can't be like just easily brushed aside like you yeah. know that at least is going to protect you for for a few arrows or whatever um right so right. you well, know certainly I mean, just certainly, go watch yeah. go watch avatar the last airbender and get all your ideas let katara <laughs> be your guide and uh you know i wish you could freeze people yeah. and stuff because that'd be a lot of fun but <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah that's you a little OP. In it, but yeah that, yeah that's just it is a cantrip but um you know for dms out there who do have players who want to take advantage of these spells looking at the the sections of the dmg where it's like interacting with objects um improvised damage from the environment uh is another uh, good one uh sometimes a good rule of thumb is just to like what would this be if it were falling, you know, if this were falling damage? And so this might be like, mm -hmm. all right, well, you know, I have a first level cleric who's going to create water and I'm going to use my reaction to then freeze it and it's going to fall on someone. Just like, what would that be if that creature fell? Like, those are some good uh, tools you can have handy so that when your players decide to do something off the wall or off label, uh, whether it's in combat or out of combat, you have guidelines with which to make those rulings. And, uh, you know, see, like, how many hits can a spontaneously frozen block of ice take before it shatters? Uh, that's, mm -hmm. you know, you have tools available for you uh, in the DMG to help you uh, rule that. Creating ice javelins for your barbarian to throw. I mean, yeah, for real. come on. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I would allow that. <laughs> yeah, certainly. That's cool. <laughs> All right. So uh, now that we've got a handle on that, Let's move on to yeah. our next one here, which is uh, which is which is a big one. This is one that a lot of people pick, uh, Mage Hand, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because Mage Hand. Classic. Mage Hand is is the classic. I'm a wizard. I need that thing from across the room. So let's just yeah. move over here. You know, Force Hand. <laughs> however you want to think about it. If you're more of a Jedi, uh, mm -hmm. but it like it even though you can't attack people with it, which is fine. That's who cares? Right. You you have attack cantrips and your your actual attacks for that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. But Mage Hand is the you're never gonna really lock me up if you keep the keys in the same room. Um sure. Yeah. Because come on. Like you just don't get them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's that like, you know, the fact that it doesn't have a material component itself as well, it, it 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 does mean that if you're in a in a place where you can see something, then you can bring it to yourself. You know, and the fact that Mage Hand also like can open doors and containers it can retrieve items and the like it you know it 
it, it's a way to interact with the environment without touching it. And in a lot of ways, it's like, that's what a 10 foot pole was. It, you know, that's why you bring uh, prods and poke sticks and, and other things into a dungeon is because you're like, I, I want to know what that is, but I'm not going anywhere near it and I don't want to touch it. And it's like mm -hmm. Mage Hand is the ultimate expression of that. It's like, I don't know what that vaporous bubbling liquid is. It, it could be harmless. It could be caustic, could be, you know, terrible. Like, I want to find out, but I don't want to get that close. Mage Hand is there for you. You know, I, I want to get this thing from across the room and hopefully it's not going to be seen. Like your little tiny spectral hand that's traveling across the room to go fetch it for you is much less, you know, likely to be seen than uh, than you are. And if you're an arcane trickster, it's invisible <laughs> as oh, well. Yeah. So there's a, this the is the like, best part of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best part of that is like, how good is a cantrip going to be that it is that it, it's the basis for an entire subclass for one of the best classes in the game? You know, like that's Mage Hand really ranks up there as, as one of my favorite versatile cantrips because of that because it's so handy no pun intended mm -hmm. uh in in oh, you, a variety you of situations <laughs> you, in, you intend All puns are unintentional. i mean you know wizards got to give each other wedgies somehow right like they're still bullying <laughs> in in hogwarts so i'm just saying like it's not an attack it doesn't do damage so sure it's humiliation. I, I would allow wedgies <laughs> uh yeah. but do you have do you have anything more you'd like to to talk about Mage Hand before we move on to one of the more uh, one of the more kind of debated spells on whether or not it's good or not? Yeah. But that's that's because uh, we're talking about minor illusion here because mm -hmm. it is it is one of the most subjective, I think. Sure. Uh, schools of of magic. Um, yeah, illusion is a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, illusions kind of. I don't know. It's it's been poo pooed. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> it's re reduced in stature to number two. Um, sure, but, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but minor illusion, though, the fact that it is, you can create anything in this size, any object, like, mm -hmm, if you're mm -hmm. using it by the rules, uh, all they need to do is fail an investigation check. Yeah. And, and, and what does that mean? A lot of people are like, oh, well, they, obviously that's an illusion like but why why is it obviously an illusion did you did you even make the role like i've, I've played it yeah. at tables where illusion was really frowned upon by the dm and it frustrated some players who leaned on that yeah yeah when, when we talk about like it, it really being dm dependent and and variable in terms of what it can do you know from table to table that's that's what we talk about because there's some gms who their creatures the way they respond they don't respond as if this image were magically real. And I can understand why, like, okay, this this caster created something out of nothing in front of the person. They clearly can see it's magical. They live in a magical world, blah, 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 blah. Like, I, I, like I, I suppose that that's one way of doing, uh, of, of interacting with that illusion as an NPC. But to me, this is really... Uh, to get the most out of illusion spells and, and starting with the, you know the cantrip here, it really does require the DM to imagine themselves as their NPCs, as the monsters, as the, the creatures, whatever, and respond appropriately to that. At the same time, it is just a cantrip, and mm -hmm. the, what I see uh, cantrips, you know, the effects of something like minor illusion happening is like it, it requires an action. That's it, right? Like they waste an action dealing with this. They waste an action poking at it to realize that it's completely visual and, and they, you know, objects pass right through it or they investigate it through some other means, the, you know, whatever it is, it, it took them an action to recognize that that was an illusion. And like, that's only one, like that's not that uh, powerful, but at the same time, it's like, well, they did spend their action doing it. And I think that that's an appropriate trade-off and a good way to like build up for more powerful illusions later on as the, mm -hmm. the person playing the, uh, the illusionist, uh, you know, continues to, to use these spells to their fullest. But, you know, let's assume that the tables have, you know, agreed to run illusions in a generous interpretation that they're going to be useful spells, uh, and that the DM doesn't want to frustrate the player. Like, all the things you can create with a uh, illusion, you know, an illusion of an object that's no more than five feet in any uh, on any side is like, all right, are we running away from something? 
can I make an illusion of a, another door in a room? Like we go through one, I'm going to make an illusion of another door on the other side that our opponent's going to come through the room and which one, which way did they go? You know, or what's this other door doing here? Uh, assuming that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the enemies aren't familiar with the place or the sound of a slamming door while you're hiding in the room uh, or something. There's a lot of things you can do with like to cause distraction or misdirection with this that are outside of like hiding behind illusory cover or trying to convince a creature that you've you know this thing that you conjured out of nowhere isn't just a, a, a you know a glimmer and you know an image of something uh, and i think like it's its capacity for creating sounds is really like uh, uh really where it's at uh, it's i think that's a fun part of this uh, particular spell Oh, most definitely. But uh, the the thought of being able to create your own Metal Gear box, so that you know they <laughs> fail that investigation check, <laughs> and they don't get their they don't get their exclamation mark, and then they leave the room, and then you get to scuttle around in your fake box. I don't know. Yep. Yeah, uh, I think that's like, what a lot of people want to use it for is inst insta oh, yeah. cover. I I'm fine with that. Yeah. You know, it's easy enough to recognize that it's an illusion. You know, it doesn't actually create cover. It just creates the illusion of cover. So it's fine if someone wants something to hide behind then they can use minor illusion to do that um it, it's perfectly uh within bounds of this kind mm -hmm. of spell oh yeah or, or just hiding in a dark corner and you just create an illusion of extra deep shadow like like mm. uh, or just you know it, it says it has to be an object so you create an illusion of a black curtain in the corner sure. that yeah. looks like yeah. shadow is how I would do yeah. that. But yeah. how, combining how it with you interpret object in this case is one thing. <laughs> exactly. But like combining it with say a mold earth where you've created a hole and then you put yeah. in a minor illusion of just the floor on top of it. Like, yeah. I mean, and then you put your, your, your frozen spikes in the bottom of that. Like, <laughs> right, I mean, yeah. this is, <laughs> this is where you're you really, have just a, you're really, a, you're really a, getting a lot of use out of those cantrips. <laughs> You're damn right. Like, that's the thing, is if you can prepare the battlefield, you don't yeah. need to have actual damaging spells. You can just mess people up. Um, yeah. yeah. That is That sort of yeah, represents like, an extreme case, but I like it, because it, it, it does work. It's very good. Very good use of the spells. <laughs> most def. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so uh, that aside, let's get to the, to the, to the great debate between amongst yeah. uh, the arcane, the druidic, and the uh, divine casters there, uh, whether or not you want to go press press a digitation druid craft or thaumaturgy, and just kind of like the those multi use type yeah. spells and like you know just kind of kind of weighing them uh, one against the other. Uh, wh where do yeah. you want to start? I mean, I think it's. I think starting with prestigitation is a good place because it's like the quintessential version of this type of spell. I think it's all three of them are, you know, let my magical character do something magical sort of spells, and yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of the effects are, the are. Yeah, right. You know, and and I I get to express the in, inherent magicness of my character with it, and like to me, prestigitation is really good because it's it it's got all the bases covered for what I expect a fantasy magician sh to be able to do. You know, I can mm -hmm. do all sorts of things if, if I'm looking to put on a magic show or, or to, you know, just I I excite <laughs> some, uh, some bumpkins, mm -hmm. but it's, it's more of the things that you can do in terms of interacting with the environment that I like. So lighting, uh, you know, a flame, whether it's candle or a uh, torch or campfire or whatever, or like instantly soiling or cleaning, Meaning something like what I want to know when I'm a player of this is how much control do I have over that when it says soil does that mean I can make myself smell exactly like the environment I'm in right like can yeah, I like, if I'm out in the like woods Arnold and Predator. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah if, I, if I'm you know if I'm out in the woods and I'm and I'm trying to uh, you know sneak up on or track something that I know as a, a sense of keen smell or something like that can I make myself smell like this place and like to me, that's entirely within line with uh, a spell like this. It's it's not permanent. You can only have a few of these at a time. You know, a few of these effects going at a time, and it's it's part of that like taking the fictional environment that the DM describes and imagining it as if it were real, and then thinking about the things that I've got in my arsenal of, of how to interact with that. You know, and and that's really why I like uh, spells like not just Mold Earth and Shape Water and Light, but Prestigitation, because it lets me like imagine this place and 
what all I can do with it and how my character can interact right. with it beyond like, I'm going to hit this thing till it's dead and then loot it and then move on. Yeah. Like it's old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, most definitely. Um, but, uh, also the creating a magical trinket, um, or, or mm. an illusory image, right? Like, like why wouldn't you have your arcane trickster do this? And that's how they create their, their lock picks. They just need them for a minute. They just need them for, sure. you know, for a round just to uh, a bit, create yeah. a little, you know, just create a little something. Yeah. Again, it's sort of like, what are we talking like trinket as in I rolled on that table in, you know, in, in the player's handbook, or is it like trinket as in a small object of indeterminate value, you know? And, and I really think like that's, this is where it's like, okay, I needed a spoon for myself because I, I got soup I have to eat and I don't have one, you know, or yeah. I, I, I need a nail file or something. So, you know, it might not be the a whole lockpick set, but it is enough to warrant a check. It's enough to give them a, a, a chance to escape or, or whatever it is that they're looking for. Like, I, I really sort of see that uh, aspect of prestigitation as, as, you know, as in line with the intent of the rules because... I don't know, just a random trinket is, I'm, I'm not sure I'd ever use that. But if I can just summon a small thing for a little bit of time, just a little thing, yeah. then it opens up the door for a lot of, um, just a lot of really, I don't know, fun interactions with the environment uh, as you're adventuring. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, just a little doodad. Uh, in, <laughs> in that, in that sense, let's move on to, uh, to Druid craft. A little, yeah. uh, little, uh, <laughs> it's Damn, a deep cut. I see what you did. For those uh, yeah, out there I that know it. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but to me, Druidcraft is kind of a disappointment. It's yeah. uh it's it's one of those that of the three of these types of spells, it's like it can do some of what Presto can. Yeah. And then but. its other effects, like the 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 weather thing to me is like it, on the surface feels like the most interesting and useful, but like mm. like you pointed out earlier, like a skill checks can just do that like yeah yeah it's it's clearly within like the the purview of uh nature and survival proficiencies to to determine whether and and like I, yeah. I think it's it's one of those where it's like how many games do you play in where needing to know the weather ahead of time was was vital and like the ones that i've played in are ones that have like deliberately made you know, outdoor survival and travel, a part of the game. They didn't hand wave it or, or reduce it to just like a few random encounters. It was, you know, something that we had to, to take into account. Is it going to rain? That's going to suck for us, but it would also means we can refill our, our water. Like, you know, knowing that uh, ahead of time works for a certain type of game, but it's not the game that's in like the baseline rules of 5e. You have to build it up from what's uh, what's available, and so it just, just mm -hmm. it seems a little lackluster in that sense. And mm -hmm. like I don't know, there's something about Druidcraft where I, it's okay. Like it's it's not the worst of all the spells, but you get so few cantrips that. Um, I, I really think it'd be a tough pick and compared to say prestigitation and thaumaturgy that's a shame because the other two are really solid like mm -hmm. I get to do a bunch of magic stuff uh, cantrips that have a lot of versatility and, and usefulness Yeah. Um, so really is, in, in contrast it, it does not shine compared to the other two yeah and you might think comparing them is not really worthwhile but like if you're taking magic initiate you're more than likely going to take one of these three like at least I yeah, really good picks when I take that. magic yeah. initiate. So you're deciding like which type of uh, which which class you want to pull your cantrips from, and so weighing these is uh, is to me is important. Which brings us to our last one here, thaumaturgy, which is to me uh, Prestidigitation's dramatic younger brother. Um, yeah. It's yeah. It's it's it does some of the same stuff. But it does them in way with way more drama and more <laughs> yeah. more pomp and circumstance, well and that's why I love it. Is yeah. you know like because this is one where if you can like if you can cast thaumaturgy or have somebody cast it on you and you're like a big like hulking guy and you want to do it and intimidate, causing harmless tremors in the ground while you're stepping and walking up to someone, to me that that gives you a little bonus on that intimidate check. Like absolutely, yeah. like I would I would rule that. <laughs> 
yeah yeah the, the little bonuses like that are i think appropriate for all these uh these cantrips but yeah the uh, thaumaturgy is the like get i need to get somebody's attention i need to draw attention mm -hmm. to myself or or uh you know you can cause a distraction just because the range is longer and and it, it's much more explicit about where the sound uh originates from but right in That's terms of just thing. making a yeah in terms of making a, just a dramatic interest and in drawing attention to yourself this is a great spell and like whereas most of the other uh, spells here really have focused on like the exploration pillar of interacting with the environment and things like that like thaumaturgy is one of those that supports the social pillar of play because oh, it, yeah. it it can be used in all sorts of you know plans and plots and schemes that players have to like distract guards or get someone's attention or like impress them or intimidate them or something like the the fact that it changes how your character interacts with others and it's an it's not subtle you know is part of the <laughs> fun of it <laughs> it's part of uh, why you can use it to set up uh, all kinds of different mm -hmm. uh, you know plans because uh, of what you can do with that like in your face bombastic uh, effects that mm -hmm. you get from thaumaturgy yeah coming in with screaming like with a screaming voice and the ground shaking and your eyes <laughs> glowing bright red i mean that's yeah. going to create a certain uh uh, scene and reaction that might you absolutely know, absolutely yeah it makes me want like favorite. my warriors to have it and you know you know what i mean like i, oh, yeah. I get why clerics it's on their list but it's like i want my want my, <laughs> my bards to have access to this or for sure for what they do mm -hmm. but uh but like also just my barbarians like i would love to have this as just something that my barbarian can do or my my fighter or something so it, oh, yeah. it, it really is fun in, in the sense of like oh god that that flaming eyed thunderous voiced earthquake stepping uh you know badass is mm -hmm. coming at us we'd better watch out you know <laughs> oh definitely definitely most definitely uh well that's uh that's that's awesome uh so i hope that uh these uh you know our discussion here helped you out uh thinking about those uh those versatile utility type cantrips there um if you could help us out by hitting, uh, if you don't already subscribe, hit that like, uh, you know, hit the bell for notifications, all that stuff that helps us with uh, the algorithm as uh, as it is. And our math teacher said we wouldn't, or we would need math. So I guess, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what point I'm making there. But I uh, hope it helps you in your game and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.